Right up to Easter, uh, we'll conclude uh, our study of the Gospel of John with the empty tomb on Easter Sunday. So in case you didn't know the end, that's the end, um, the empty tomb. Actually, it's not the end of the Gospel, but it's where we'll conclude. So um, when we turn there, I want to remind you uh, of where we are. And there's something interesting about John's Gospel. It's 21 chapters long. And the first about 11 or 12 chapters are about three years of Jesus' life. But starting with about chapter 13 all the way to end, about the second half of the gospel is really just the last week of Jesus' life. And so you get half of the gospel for three whole years almost, and then half of the gospel with just that last week. And it doesn't take a literary genius to know that maybe John is zeroing in on, he's emphasizing this last week and the importance of it. And we can be reminded, um, as we heard often in the fall when we were looking at John's gospel, he tells us in the 20th chapter why he wrote this gospel. He says, I write these things to you so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life. And so it's important for us to know why we have these words before us. It is because John wants us to believe that Jesus is who he said he was, that is the Son of God and the Savior, and that by believe, believing we might have eternal life. In this 17th chapter, we pick up right at the end of Jesus' final evening together with his disciples. He's within a few hours of going to the cross here. And in John chapter 17, he has been together with these disciples in that upper room, it's called. And they have had a meal together. They've celebrated the Passover. Jesus has shared some things with them. He's washed their feet as an example that they are to follow after. But he's also warned them about some things. And here at the very last chapter of that time together uh, is what's called the high priestly prayer. It's called the high priestly prayer because one of the offices that Jesus fulfills for us is that of priest. He is a prophet, he's a priest, and he is our king. And here is a prayer that we have the privilege to see that Jesus prays. And it's broken often into three parts. The first five verses that we're going to look at today is Jesus' prayer concerning himself which may sound strange, but as we look at it, I think you'll find it instructive. And then in the middle part of this prayer, the longest part, he prays for his disciples. And then at the end, he prays for Christians everywhere or what we might call the church. So as we think about prayer, and we'll read this, these first five verses shortly, but there's a lot of different kinds of prayers, isn't there? Um, there are the kinds of prayers that um, or maybe aren't always appreciated. You ever been in a restaurant? Maybe you've done this and you've preached that evangelistic blessing for the benefit of everyone in the restaurant. You've heard that from some distant corner of the restaurant. You hear, let us pray. Dear Lord. And it's loud for everyone and maybe even throw it in. For all those who didn't bless their own food today, bless that food this day. It is a prayer, no doubt, but maybe not for the right reasons and the right content. Or maybe there's that kind of insincere, angry prayer. You ever prayed this one? Lord, help me for I kill this woman. You <laughs> prayed that prayer? I'm not sure that's the best prayer either. Um, then there's that prayer out of desperation, but also for other people's benefit. Uh, it's like the little boy who was being unruly in church and got snatched up by his dad. And just before they went out the back door for him to receive his spanking, the boy yells to the congregation, y'all pray for me. <laughs> but sometimes it could be a good thing to pray uh, sincerely before God, but also for the instruction of those who you may be with. Um, and sometimes that can go off track. Uh, there was one man who at the back of the door thanked the preacher for the sermons. He said, thank you for both of those sermons today. And the preacher said, what do you mean? He said, well, the one you preached and the one you prayed. Sometimes sermons, uh, prayers um, can be lengthy and they sound more like that. Um, I wasn't going to tell this, but I, I, not out of any disrespect 
at all, but at Christmas time when we were away, we were at my home church and the pastor was away uh, that day as I was from our church. And so they had a guest pastor there and they asked one of the members of the church to do the pastoral prayer. And um, he had taken the visiting preacher's text um, and was going to pray through that text. And he basically preached a whole nother sermon. And um, afterwards, I was sitting, I turned to one of my brothers and I said, man, that was some prayer. And um, he said, I know I started to time it. And somebody chimed in, someone that's related to me and sitting down front here today said, 15 minutes. <laughs> but you know, teaching through praying and praying over someone or with someone, um, it's not a terrible thing. Some of you may have prayed that kind of prayer with your children when they were young. You prayed something like, please help Sally not to leave her bed unmade and, to be, and help her to be more respectful to her mommy and her daddy. That's not a terrible thing. And I can remember when my kids were very young, sitting on the bed with them at night in prayer, and usually either they would pray, then I would pray, or I would pray, then they would pray. And when I prayed, when they were very young, I, I felt an obligation to kind of model the kinds of prayers I wanted them to pray. And even so much as trying to uh, demonstrate confession of sin in a prayer, even with um, a two-year-old. And it pleased me greatly um, to see them mimic that model of prayer, to hear a two-year-old ask for forgiveness uh, for their sins, and sometimes even being very specific about those things. Well, all that to say this, that I think this prayer that Jesus prays, it's his prayer. In fact, sometimes it's called the Lord's Prayer, not the Lord's Prayer as in our Father who art in heaven that we've prayed together, but this is very specific to Jesus. In fact, it's the longest prayer that Jesus prayed uh, that's recorded in Scripture anyway. And someone said it only takes about three and a half minutes to read the whole thing, so maybe it can be instructive to, that, uh, to us in that. But not so much how long he prayed, but sort of what drives this prayer. And at the beginning of it, these first five verses, we'll see that Jesus... Uh, is praying, I think, in a way that acknowledges who he is, who the Father is, but he also wants to help uh, those who are with him, his disciples. And for that reason, it's a prayer that can be helpful to us as well. So let's look at the first part of this prayer today, the first five verses. This is Jesus praying. John chapter 17. After Jesus said this, he looked towards heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that your son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. This prayer that Jesus prayed, although it is prayed to the Father, I think it's surely meant to bring comfort and peace to his disciples. And we'll see even more so next week in the second part of this prayer that comes out very clearly. But even in this first part, some of these things may sound strange to us because it is God the Son praying to God the Father. It's a very unique prayer in that way, but I think it can be instructive for us, particularly for these disciples in this very difficult moment. Jesus had shared some very difficult, and we might even say some disturbing things with his disciples during this last evening together. He spoke of his own death, he spoke of Judas's betrayal and Judas left in the middle of this meal together. He spoke of Peter's denial that would happen just within a few hours of this. He spoke about Jesus himself going away. And he spoke about the world's hatred of the disciples. He even says these words that the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think that they are offering service to God. That's some ominous things that he's laid upon these now 11 men after Judas has left. But he says at the very beginning here, John tells us that he says, Father, the hour has come. 
And the hour is not 60 minutes here. In fact, John has talked a lot about this hour that is to come. It refers, it refers more broadly not to a particular period of time, but this moment, this climactic moment in Jesus' life when the, he's on the precipice of his death and his resurrection. And even what we'll find here, the glorification of Jesus when he's exalted to the place and returns to his seat with the Father. And early on in this gospel, uh, we've heard about this hour that it had not yet come. If you remember way back in chapter 2, when they're at a wedding and the wine runs out, do you remember that? His mother comes to him, Mary comes to Jesus and says, Jesus, they're all out of wine. And Jesus says, well, why are you coming to me? My hour has not yet come. He does a miracle there and... They have great wine to finish off the wedding reception there. But Jesus is not ready to yet fully be revealed as to all that he is and all that he's going to do. In fact, in the middle of, of, of John in chapter 7 and in chapter 8, when the swell of, of anger against Jesus is coming to a crescendo and people sought to do harm to Jesus, it says, and yet no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. There's something comforting about that, that Jesus, even in this prayer, reminds us that God is still in control of all of this history that's going on there. And this hour will not take place until God is ready for it to take place. It's why the Gospels tell us that at just the right time, Paul says, that Christ died for us. It wasn't going to be too early or too late. It was going to be in God's timing there. In other places, um, John reminds us at least two other times in his gospel that Jesus says, my time has not yet come. And what he means is, is that there is a purpose for which I came to this earth and things will not be done uh, according to human time, but according to when God will reveal all of this. And when Jesus says uh, in the beginning of the end here in this last half, he finally in, in chapter 12 says, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. And here again at the end of this time together, he says, now is that time. And we find that very shortly after speaking these words, the events of Jesus' death are in motion. And he says, that this moment that has been planned literally for all eternity is now at hand. What a moment for this prayer to be offered. So what does he pray? He says the hour is, has come. The very first thing he says is glorify your son that your son may glorify you. Now glory, God's glory, is central to not only to this prayer, but to really to John's whole gospel. It is that God is revealing who Jesus is and the work that Jesus will do will ultimately result in God's glory. It's simply this, is that if John is right, that we are sinners in need of salvation and God has sent his one and only son in order to accomplish that salvation for us, then who gets the credit? Who's lifted up? Who's exalted? Whose name is above every name and is the name of Jesus who points ultimately to the heavenly Father. And so as we read through those five times in five verses, he mentions this glory that it is to belong to God. And Jesus says, glorify your son. In other words, Jesus is saying, do what you sent me here to do through me and in me and with me so that people will know who you are and give glory to God. So there's four things, and I, um, I, I, I like so much the way one commentator put this. I want to use his phrases for these four parts here. Um, if you know John MacArthur, you know how good of, of an outline he can put together. And when I read this, I thought, I can't do better than this. I just want to share this with you. The four things that Jesus prays here is about the right he possesses, the relationship he offers, the requirement he meets, and the reverence he deserves. And quickly, what does he mean by those things? The right he possesses. Well, Jesus says in verse 2, for you, speaking to God, granted him, speaking of himself, authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Jesus says that his authority 
is over all creation. Not just all men, but all things. John has told us that Jesus is the source of eternal life. It's his theme in his gospel. And as we've read through the gospel of John, we've seen that Jesus demonstrates authority in his teaching, in his healing, in his casting out of demons, in lots of other miracles that he did, in violating some of the Jewish customs. He says, I'm not held to this law because I'm the fulfillment of the law. He cleansed the temple in demonstrating his authority over it. He even forgives sin demonstrating his ultimate authority in that and he offers salvation and he's even willing to receive worship from other people. Jesus clearly understands that what God has given him is authority over all things. But look at what the purpose of that authority is. For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life. If he's in charge, then it's him who decides those things. And it is in this authority that we are granted eternal life. It is by the Son of God. Again, John's purpose in this gospel is that we might know and believe that Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah, and by believing we might have eternal life. And so Jesus says that authority has been granted him by the Father that he might give eternal life. So that is the right that Jesus possesses. It is as the Son of God, He has authority over all things. The second thing is, well, and we should say, if Jesus had authority in this place at this time for these things, it stands to reason that He still has authority over all people, including you and including me. And maybe it's lost because it's so obvious in the teachings of the scripture at times is that where do we find our source of salvation? It is the one who has authority to give it. It's only in Jesus Christ. So that's the right that he possesses. The relationship that he offers is this, verse 3. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. It is in our relation to Jesus Christ. Now we do mean that relationship of talking to, walking with, being with all those things, but also what we mean by being related to Christ is that we receive His life, His benefits, His righteousness. It is in relation to Christ that we are saved. Not just in knowing who Christ was, but accepting what He has done for us. And so John says, this is eternal life to know the only true God, Jesus Christ. It is Christ himself, the son of God, who offers that eternal life. So that's the relationship that's offered to us only in Jesus Christ. Third thing, it's the requirement that he meets. Listen to what he says in verse four. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. Jesus is the ultimate finisher of that thing. And now is that he's saying that now the hour has come. It is in all the things that have transpired. Um, he has done the work that God has given him to do. And in these next few hours, the culmination of all that will happen. And sometimes it's lost that we hear the message of the gospel that Jesus died for our sins. But the whole rest of Jesus' life is not inconsequential to us. And what I'm saying is, is that Jesus' life that he led, especially in those three years of public ministry leading up to this hour, are just as important to us. It is that perfect life that he led in perfect obedience to God. Now he can become the sacrifice for our sins. Without that perfect life, he couldn't be a perfect sacrifice. Just any old man couldn't have died for your sins or for mine. It took the perfect son of God who had lived that perfect life of obedience. I even like this message that this was always what he was about. This is the work that God gave him to do. It's what he came to this earth to do, to live that perfect life and to die that perfect death. And so it is the requirement, that satisfaction that God requires for our sin that comes through Jesus Christ. And finally, 
It is the reverence that he deserves. Now, reverence might not be the best place here, uh, best word here, but it is simply this, is that the glory that is due to God the Father also is due to God the Son. And we're reminded that when he prays in verse 5, and now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. What's he saying there? We're reminded in that prayer that from where did Jesus come? He came from his throne in heaven and came to this earth as a servant. And we can't help but turn to Philippians where it describes this, what's called the condescension of Jesus is that he left this high, glorious place to come and serve and ultimately to die upon this earth. If you know the Christ hymn, it's called in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse 6, it says about Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the nature of a servant being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so Paul is reminding the Philippian people in this letter that it is Jesus who left his glorious position with God the Father and came to this earth humble as a servant and became obedient even to death on a cross. And there's the part then when we pick up where we read in our unison reading together, because Jesus did all those things, therefore, verse 10, verse 9 says, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. It is when Jesus came to this earth, and now once he has died and been resurrected, he ascended to be with the Father and take his place of ultimate glory there. And now his name is above every name and is to be exalted, that every knee shall bow. Notice what it said, on earth and heaven and even under the earth. Even the demons will bow at the name of Jesus in his ultimate exalted glory. Well, if we take all this and we say, well, those are all fine and well, and that's good for Jesus' prayer, and he's pointed out some important things. Why is this something that we can look at to be of comfort? Why is it that this prayer could be so significant that Jesus prayed at this high moment, this difficult moment of his life, and particularly with those of his disciples. And maybe it's just simply this, that we can look to Jesus who is the exalted Son of God. And that in this moment that was extremely difficult for Jesus, in fact, Jesus is going to pray that this might even pass from Him. He was not anxious for this hour to get there because He knew the difficulty of it. But in His prayer, He has God's glory as His ultimate concern. And I'm reminded, I know I've shared this with our Bible study here before, but there was a life-changing moment that I got to observe someone who I think modeled this kind of attitude for Jesus. When I was a young youth minister in Meridian, there was a man who was an elder in our church that was diagnosed with colon cancer. Um, and several weeks went by after the diagnosis, they were deciding what they could do. And there is um, very successful treatments for that, but it's a scary thing. And before he was to go to have surgery to have a portion of his colon removed and then he would do some, some chemotherapy or radiation or both, I, I don't recall, he asked if he could have the other elders of the church and the pastors there meet to pray for him. Um, and I assumed when he would come to pray, he would pray, you know, help me not to be so scared, pray that I would be healed, pray that the surgery would be successful. And we gathered together there at the church and the pastor said, Jim, how can we pray for you? And he said, I just want you to pray that I will be a good testimony for Christ no matter what happens. Now there's a man who understands what Jesus was praying here. I'm sure he wanted to be healed. I'm sure he didn't want to be afraid. I'm sure he didn't want his family to be without a husband, a father, and all those things. But ultimately, his concern in his own heart was that he give glory to God that he demonstrates what life in Christ 
is all about. For all those to see. And a short time later, as if you know about colon cancer, it's extremely hereditary. Uh, one of his three sons was diagnosed with the same cancer. And what a great blessing for a son to have such an immediate example from his father as to how to face something so difficult. And I'm reminded that we too have one to follow after. That in this hour, this terrible hour in Jesus' life, He's been betrayed, will shortly be denied by one of his closest disciples, will suffer and die. In that hour, Jesus prays according to his authority. He prays about this finished work that is done there, about the ministry that he will have, that Jesus, we are told in Hebrews, that when he ascends to the right hand and returns to his glory, that he is also to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. Part of Christ's glory is that he's looking down on you and me today and he prays for us. He prays according to that authority and he prays by that finished work and he says, that one belongs to me. I died for him and for her. And ultimately, it is his glory and the glory of the Father that's held out. And so I'd ask you today, can we commit ourselves to that kind of prayer, to that kind of life, to that kind of example, to live a life that's under the authority of Christ, that is about the life and the ministry of Christ, that knows that it is our relation to him that brings eternal life. And above all things, that whatever we do, wherever we go, whatever might happen to us, good and bad, that it is for God's glory that we can live. And we return that glory, not for ourselves, but we give it to Him. Can we pray? Our Father in heaven, it is our privilege to worship a sovereign God, one who from all eternity has set your love on us, that you have given your Son, Jesus, for our eternal life. And so I pray that this day that there may be many here today that are in that most difficult time of their life, that they can ultimately sincerely seek the glory of God through those circumstances. And we pray that by the authority of Jesus Christ that's been given to him, that as we receive eternal life, we would also receive strength and power uh, to live according to your will and for your glory. And so I pray as we go from here this day that in the big moments and what even seem small moments that we could give glory, praise, and honor to Christ and Christ alone. That by believing in him that we would have that eternal life, but we would live a different kind of life and that the world would see Jesus Christ in us and through us. And so that's our prayer this day and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Can we stand and sing together? Uh, hymn number 542. It's a simple uh, little verses there. Lord, be glorified. And that's our prayer today. And let's sing together. Hymn 542. receive this benediction. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that it is work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. 
Amen.